My name is Trudy Logan and I'm the founder and CEO of Arrhythmia Alliance. Arrhythmia Alliance is a collaboration of patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals and policy makers. And we want to bring to you today education so you can better understand living with arrhythmias. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Hugh Colkins, Medical Director of Arrhythmia Alliance. Uh, Professor Colkins is based at John Hopkins in Baltimore. Welcome. Professor Parkins, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Drew. It's good to be here. Thank you. Um, I have a variety of questions for you from our panel. A lot of them very worried, very anxious. So if we could just go through them, and I know your expertise will be invaluable in reassuring uh, the patients. So Professor Calkins, we're living through a pandemic right now and we've heard of hospital appointments being cancelled, surgeries being postponed and here at the Arrhythmia Alliance we are inundated with inquiries from worried, anxious patients. Uh, atrial fibrillation tends to affect the older population and we also know that coronavirus seems to have a greater impact on the older population. So, are patients at a higher risk for contracting COVID or coronavirus if they have AF? Or are there, is it because they have AF um, and they may contract that it's going to be more of a struggle to recover from? I think it's more, not so much the AFib, but the fact that patients with AFib, many have heart dysfunction or lung disease or hypertension, other comorbidities. As you point out, age and hypertension are some of the most important risk factors for COVID or having a tough time with COVID. And AFib travels you know, in that group. That, that's a group that's more likely to have AFib. But I don't think it's the AFib that is really the, the, the key thing that makes you a, a high-risk patient for COVID infection. I think it's these other factors lung disease, hypertension, age, that kind of stuff. Would you say, Professor Colkins, to pa patients with any type of arrhythmia, that they should just follow the guidelines? That are they at any greater risk with contracting COVID-19? Or is it because of these other uh, symptoms that they may, may contract it? Yeah. No, I don't think they're at higher risk. I think it's because of the other conditions they may have. I mean, I think when you think about COVID, we hear in all the news stations, certainly in the US, about all the deaths and all the funeral homes being full and you know, all the tragedies. But the reality is, like at Hopkins, that you know, the mortality from COVID is extremely, extremely low at tertiary care medical centers. You know, a lot has been learned in how to care for these patients. So it's one thing some of the hospitals and just, you know, the, in, in New York, they got overwhelmed and they were not academic medical centers and, and they, I think, may have had some poor outcomes uh, in, in some of the other countries. But, you know, certainly in the U.S., like at Hopkins, if patients get proper care, you know, a lot of it's pulmonary related, you know, very, very few patients are dying of the disease. It's not five or 10 percent. It's, it's, you know, it's closer to one percent or less kind of thing. So it's not quite as horrific as we thought. That said, clearly you should make every effort not to get it. And, and some of these social distancing practices that people recommend, I certainly am respectful of those. And, and finally, we, we get a lot of inquiries from patients that have gone into AF, and normally they would be calling their doctor or going to the emergency room, but they're concerned about going to hospitals now because of COVID. So what would your advice be? If somebody has gone into AF, should they be going to ER? Should they be seeing their doctor? What should they be doing? Well, I mean, first, in general, I discouraged AFib patients from running to emergency rooms even before COVID appeared on the scene. I mean, AFib is a chronic condition. It doesn't kill people other than the stroke issue, which we discussed. And most AFib episodes will stop on their own. So a lot of it's about patient education, reassurance. Yes, you go into AFib. Well, if, you, if, you're, if your blood pressure is good, you may not feel perfect. If you just wait it out, it will probably stop in a day or two on its own, or you take an extra beta blocker, calcium channel blocker to slow it down. You know, there's no need to come into the emergency room. You'll just be waiting four hours and 
and, and, and they'll give you, you know, something to slow it down. You could have dealt with that at home. So I have never been a fan of patients with AFib going to the emergency rooms. And now with COVID, it's all the more reason not to go. That said, if you pass out or you feel like you're going to pass out or you're having chest pain, you know, or your heart rate's going crazy fast and you just feel awful, you know, you should not be afraid to call 911, go to the emergency room, get the help you need. You know, a lot of what we're doing, learning now is that a lot of healthcare can be done through telemedicine. So now instead of seeing patients in the office, we see them over the, the phone with a virtual link up, you know, on uh, whether it's, uh, you, you know, the Apple phone, you know, your, 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 or, or some other web link like we're using now. And you can accomplish a lot by calling your doctor, selling out, setting up a telemedicine appointment. And it turns out it's a lot more convenient for the patient and the doctor. I mean, the patient doesn't have to wait because you have a reserved time when the doctor's going to be sitting there on his computer. You call in, no waiting, no commuting, you, you know, no lines, no risk of corona. And, and as much as we like to think that listening to the patient's heart is important and listening to their lungs are important, you know, most of it's talking to the patient and getting their EKG. And there's a lot of devices now that are available where patients can get a little machine that will generate their own EKG. You can show to your physician. There's a, the one that I often recommend is the live core, but there's a number of other, these little gadgets. So a patient has their EKG machine, the doctor can see it. You can have a discussion over the phone and keep people out of the hospital and out of the clinic. So I think, I think this is one of the few good things about COVID is it's moving telemedicine forward very rapidly. And certainly patients are saying exactly the same thing. Those who are fortunate enough to, to have a telephone call with their doctor are saying it's, it's much better. And certainly with the likes of a live call and remote monitoring, do you think that will become the new norm, as everybody is saying, once we're, we're through this pandemic? It may be patients won't need to go to the hospital as often, but will speak directly to their doctor on these various video platforms. Yeah, I think telemedicine's here to stay. I mean, it might be that for your first appointment with your doctor to meet them, you come in and actually see them in an office, but follow-up appointments are all just by, you know, you have an AFib ablation. You'd have a one-one one follow-up appointment. You just have that appointment over the phone. You know, very, very convenient. And uh, I think people are going to get really comfortable with this. You can be on a vacation. You can be wherever. You can phone into your doctor. You know, it's really great. So I've become quite impressed with it. And by, even though a doctor can't do a fancy physical, just by seeing a patient, seeing the expression on their face, you know, you get a sense that someone's sick or not. And that, that gives us a lot of feedback. And, and anyhow, this has been a, a, a good, one of the few good things about COVID. And that's exactly what our patients are saying as well. Positive out of this. They, they actually feel they're having greater access to their healthcare uh, team. So Thank you, Professor Calkins, on behalf of Rhythmia Alliance and all our patients for providing this valuable information. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Trudy. Take care.